um, the United States sent out a press release saying, we're sorry, but a weather plane was shot down. It's sad for the unfortunate crew. You already had a cover story left. Over. And Khrushchev was furious and announced over Soviet state media, we've shot down a spy plane. And, we said, and the U.S. responded, typical Soviet treachery. Well, then they brought out the pilot who was alive and the wreckage, which is still in the Russian War Museum in Moscow. The wreckage for the U-2. Yes. Okay. Uh, and the U.S. Say, say it again. Yeah. Yeah, that would be all the world together would do that. Yeah. Antarctica. And with that, the Paris conference was dead. Cold War heated up. It's no coincidence that both sides, they actually did a moratorium. They kind of quit testing open air, uh, quit doing open air tests of nuclear weapons. That ended. It's you know, a year and a half later, the Soviets will explode the 100 megaton Tsar bomb. I mean, it got a lot more confrontational. And it's perfect timing for a revolution in Cuba. In Cuba. The United States, remember way back in 1903, the Platt Amendment after the Spanish-American War, the United States had been propping up dictators. Well, the U.S. supported dictator, at least for a while, he, he became too corrupt for the Eisenhower administration, Fiorella Batista. And he was heavily connected with organized crime. Mob, the mafia came in and had a bunch of casinos in, in Havana. They flew down, and uh, wealthy people from the East Coast would fly down to Havana. It was kind of a playground. Well, there was revolutionaries under a young lawyer by the name of Fidel Castro. And if you go to the National Archives, you have a letter from Fidel Castro to Franklin Roosevelt, admiring Roosevelt in 1944. So I thought, that would be cool. He was not even in law school. He was a revolutionary. They had begun a guerrilla war. And Castro's fighters hadn't really won any battles. But Batista's government was so corrupt that as long as Castro's forces stayed in the battle, as long as they stayed in battle, they're kind of winning. And then on New Year's Eve and then New Year's Day on January 1st, 1959, Batista's army just crumbled. Remember Chiang Kai-shek's army crumbled in 49? It was like that. The army just dissolved. And the Batista regime fled. He was incredibly wealthy by then, fled up to Florida. A lot of, of members of his government fled to Florida. Castro swept in. Here he is riding in Havana, victorious. I should have, we don't know exactly what Castro was. He was a nationalist, he was a revolutionary. We don't know what kind of government he was actually thinking of. He clearly had authoritarian tendencies about what's going to happen. But it's one of those great what ifs. Because at first, the cat. Um, the Eisenhower administration was actually kind of happy. Batista was so corrupt that it was, if, they, if Castro would be less corrupt but more amenable to what the United States wanted, you know, it would look better around the world. But then when Castro started talking land reform, remember land reform, buying up the land? Once he started that, was he a communist? In 1960, Castro went up to the United Nations. He was kind of a minor celebrity. He went on television shows. Here he is on the Ed Sullivan show. Sullivan, but yeah, again, Sullivan show. Remember, I showed you Elvis on there. There's even met with Vice President Nixon, and Nixon walked out of there saying he is either a communist or fully indoctrinated in Marxist thinking. So he will. And Nixon was predetermined to think that politically, it was good for him to think that, but. They decided he was a communist, and they immediately started to organize a plan to get Castro out, very similar to Guatemala. They started organizing this plan. The issue is, though, there's an election going. Yeah. Well, he's certainly going to become, you know, he, he will at least do, but there is a lot of disagreement if he was actually going to be a full-scale communist. His first government had was a coalition of all sorts of different people. But then once the United States started efforts to overthrow him, he got rid of any opposition. So he became very authoritarian, without a doubt. Now, he's going to be incredibly popular. 
amongst probably a majority of the Cuban population, but for very good reason, a lot of Cubans are going to be very upset with Castro too. And so it's going to be one thing the United States never really understood the Cuban politics behind them. But, oh, here he is. I like this. This is in 1960 in New York. He was such kind of a celebrity. They all came in with the Castro beards on. I just found that amusing. Oh, he ate it up. He was a minor celebrity. And he really played the role of revolutionary. His beard really kind of had that. And as the United States started more and more calling them a communist and implying another Guatemala, that pushed them closer to Khrushchev. And that leads right into, we could say, the 1960s. Because the 1960s, I know we've already kind of begun that, but with Castro, the disaster of Paris, U2, Sputnik, atomic bomb. I mean, this is a atomic bombs, and don't forget South Vietnam. The election of 1960 will be the first election where whoever will win will be the first president not born, or born, I'm sorry, first president born in the 20th century. Now, this was still before primaries chose the candidates, and so it was basically done by the conventions. And John Kennedy, a relatively unknown senator from Massachusetts from a very wealthy family, was able to use this to kind of manufacture this uh, image of himself. Remember the commercials in Eisenhower? He would get the nomination, and he was really unknown. He had been in the Senate Congress from 48, Senate from 52, but he has virtually no record. In fact, for a lot of it, he was, he was deathly ill. And that was one of the great secrets of the Kennedy election and presidency. He was near death many times. He was he basically was hospitalized, bedridden, and given the last rites in 1957 because of five years never died. He dropped down to 110 pounds. He was on a cocktail of steroids, amphetamines, and um, and then barbiturates to sleep. This cocktail of drugs, and they kept it secret. And also, he was a war hero. His his patrol boat called PT-109 was rammed by a Japanese destroyer, and in the process of this, he had, had a horrible back injury. So he was also on all these painkillers. They kept it secret. They kept that secret. And so he's going to look very fit and vigorous. Well, yeah, he's taking unbelievably large amounts of steroids, probably Addison's disease. Well, he wasn't quite dead yet, but yeah, he was very ill. And yeah, I mean, they were always worried he might die. Yeah. So this is it. Did he have some kind of like probably Addison's disease? It's a disease of those. Hmm? Yeah. You just see that. Yeah. What's that? <laughs> <You're talking. laughs> yeah. It was something about, it's a, a massive and more known imbalances, but basically the big thing was his body organs did not function like. And they know a little bit better now. Back then, they just literally pumped him full of drugs. And, but he looked really fit and vigorous. And he, so he had no record, so they could invent it. But shocking everybody, the Senate Majority Leader, Lyndon Baines Johnson, remember FDRs? So we had John Fitzgerald Kennedy, Lyndon Baines Johnson, JFK and LBJ. He accepted the vice presidency, surprising everybody. He was this, incredibly powerful master in the United States Senate. And he gave that up to be the vice president because what does the vice president do? Breaks ties in the Senate. Oh, and waits for the president to die. But the big reason he did it to be a loyal Democrat, Kennedy was a liberal from Massachusetts. So they wanted somebody from the South to balance it out to get Southern votes because they were worried Remember Strom Thurmond, 1948, and the Democrats were starting to be split over civil rights. The Republicans nominated Richard Nixon. Nixon, the vice president, known as a hatchet man, tried to rehabilitate, rehabilitate himself, an incredibly intelligent man. They were friends in the Senate. And Nixon liked John Kennedy, but thought he was kind of a lightweight. So really thought you know, he could... Beat him pretty good. But the problem Nixon had was 
even though people now knew about the U-2, the United States still kept it secret the extent of the U-2. So the U.S. didn't know very big secrets about the Soviet missile program. So the Kennedy campaign, they pushed this concept of the missile gap. That because of Sputnik, the Soviets have all these long-range intercontinental ballistic missiles that can fly over the Arctic and in the United States in minutes. Remember the bomber gap in 52. And people believed it because of Sputnik and Eisenhower and Nixon could not counter it. Just as Truman couldn't counter for Stevenson back in 52. There was a huge missile gap. The United States had many missiles, over a thousand. Thor and Jupiter missiles in Turkey, Italy, Norway, Japan could hit the Soviet Union almost every place in minutes, and the U.S. was making ICBMs. Here's a, you could buy this in the 1980s, a plastic model kit. You could paint yourself a light of Soviet and American ICBMs. We should get that. That could be our final project. Hmm? Yeah, let's do it. Uh, this is a Titan, this massive, really dangerous liquid-fueled missile. We have those, and then we we're just about ready to make this thing called the Minutemen, which are much safer. They're solid fuel, so safer. Solid fuel needs like dry climate, or the fuel um, begins to degrade. Can anyone think of a dry climate? That Minuteman three Minuteman missiles might be good. Hmm, I, I can't think of any. I can think of no areas near Great Falls that would be perfect for Minuteman missiles. That's why Minuteman missiles. That's why Maelstrom Air Force Base. That's why. And and we also had these missiles. The Soviets had one, maybe two missiles total that were liquid fueled and took two days to refuel. Two days to fuel. The fuel was on stay. There was a huge missile gap, but it went the other way. I should add, Khrushchev is very disturbed by this talk. Very disturbed. Also, Kennedy will challenge Nixon to the first ever presidential debate. TV would change everything. Now, this is a short little clip from the American experience about Nixon. So let's watch just a little bit of this. Richard Nixon stood at the top of his party. As he mapped out an ambitious 50-state campaign, he was challenged by his opponent, John F. Kennedy, to a series of televised debates, the first in American history. Even when hospitalized for two weeks with a knee injury, Nixon remained confident. Richard Nick to a series of televised debates, first in American history. Nixon had a staph infection and had to be hospitalized for two weeks. In fact, he lost between 20 and 30 pounds and was very, very ill. But he still was going to do this debate. And so there he is practicing with his, his wife right there. Even when hospitalized for two weeks with a knee injury, Nixon remained confident, anxious for the debates to begin, eager once again to use television to talk directly to the voters. At the time, there was a feeling that this overall might be a mismatch. Nixon was the candidate who had more prominence, who had been a member of the House, a member of the Senate, and the Vice President of the United States. Kennedy, he didn't have a particularly uh, strong reputation in Congress. He, there was some feeling that he was, to some extent, a playboy, but he wasn't too serious a senator. So I think people felt that Nixon had the edge. And I think Nixon felt that he had the edge. The candidates need no introduction. Ah! So if you look at this picture, you see a problem right away. First off, look at the suits. Gray suits are still the stock. That's what Nixon wore. But think about a gray suit on black and white TV. It just kind of blends in with the back, doesn't it? Kennedy really stands out in this dark suit, dark top. This looks like kind of a disembodied head floating there. And then him holding his knee, he banged his knee on the limousine getting out before the debate. And he was in agony. 
It was that same knee he hurt. It really wasn't healed. And his suit didn't fit. He had lost weight and it seemed to look big on him. His head just seemed like it was like his neck shrunk and he just looked even smaller. And a couple more things. Both men said they didn't want makeup. Don't mention that again, but you know, men don't wear makeup. Men don't wear makeup. But the Kennedy people knew the TV catches everything. So they snuck him into a bathroom for, for, for the debate and put makeup to hide you and blunt you. TV catches everything. Nixon not only did not use makeup, he had a couple other things. First off, he was a sweater. He just sweated a lot. And studios back then had to have a lot of lights because the cameras really couldn't pick up light. Light, lamps, heat. And so they're always hot. The other thing is, he was a guy who had a full beard constantly. You know, five o'clock shadow. He was always coming out. He's one of those guys he grunted doing er, bullshit. And so <laughs> there's this thing called shave stick. And they still sell something like this called Nair. And it was a pretty nasty chemical to it eats hair away. Well, shave stick had that. So imagine like stick deodorant. And they just smeared that on his face. This white cream. And it was going to get rid of the five o'clock shadow. Well, I guess it stunk too. But it didn't get rid of all the five o'clock shadow, but also think about it. He's already pale from being hospitalized. He's gaunt. He looks sick. He looks like a floating head. And then you have this shade stick on. Under the heat lamps, he started to sweat, he started to shimmer. Then glop started running down his face. People called up the, their television station and said, please help this man, he's dying. One newspaper reporter said he looked like a sinister chipmunk on the television screen. You must understand that Nixon himself had said, I don't want any makeup on for this, these particular debates. What I tried to explain to Dick was he has a certain characteristics of his skin where it's almost transparent. And it was a very nice thought to say, uh, you know, I don't want any makeup, but that he really needed it in order to have what we would call even an acceptable television picture. And of course, JFK, here he'd been riding in motorcades all over California with the top down. He looked like a bronze warrior when he came into Chicago. He really did. Mr. Nixon comes out of the Republican Party. He was nominated by it. And it is a fact that through most of these last 25 years, the Republican leadership has opposed federal aid for education, medical care for the aged. I know what attention. it means to be poor. I know what it means to see people who are unemployed. I know Senator Kennedy feels as deeply about these problems as I do. But our disagreement is not about the goals for America, but only about the means to reach those goals. The first debate was costly to Nixon. You, the radio audience thought he had won, but the largest television audience in history had seen the vice president haggard and drawn and had been. So, it was close by the radio audience. So it wasn't like this overwhelming victory. But people on television saw Kennedy. He looked like what people wanted him to look like. And that is why this is so important. The 1960 debate would forever cement image is more important than reality. Remember what I told you, Kennedy was not young, fit, and vigorous. Yet he looked like it. This image. And people are going to be very successful with totally different types of image, image than John Kennedy. That's not the point. They find an image that works to get people elected. You see this for any number of different races. And therefore, what really matters, what politicians do, become less and less important than image. Kennedy was not a great legislator in Congress, and then he'll be president, and he wasn't good at it, but he was good at looking like what people wanted their president to look like. That was the image we wanted in 1960. But you'll see it's something totally different in 1980. Another man named Ronald Reagan was very much an actor, very much involved in this, but he portrayed the image that people wanted in 1980. I should add that he did two more debates. Not, not as many people watched him, both men, were wearing the darkest suit you've ever seen in your life. And guess how much makeup both were wearing in the next one. And if you watch the 2020 presidential debates between Biden and Trump, both men had so much makeup on, they looked almost like they were made out of plastic. I don't know if you noticed that. They had a lot of makeup on, just covered in it. And not that there's anything good or bad about makeup, I just find it so, so amusing that uh, they're like, I can't do it because I'm a man. Okay, so with that,
even though the election would turn out to be very short. You want to see another Kennedy ad? <gasps> I lied. I for president, I for president, I for president, I for president. You like Ike, I like Ike, everybody likes Ike. For president, hang out the banner, beat the drum. See, we'll see, aren't you Washington. happy I played this? We don't want John or, or Harry, let's do that. Do you want to see the Kennedy ad? See, see if you can guess who this ad is for. <laughs> want a man for president who's okay, seasoned like through and through, but not so doggone seasoned that he won't try something new. A man who's old enough to know and young enough to do. Well, it's up to you. It's up to you. It's strictly up to you. But it's Kennedy, 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 the popular vote vote was only set right by 0.1%. 0.1%. But the Electoral College would be a Kennedy victory. There's stories of perhaps some uh, ballot stuffing by the Democratic machine in Chicago, but also there might have been ballot stuffing from Southern uh, Illinois Republicans, so I guess it probably balanced out. You also notice that a few of the Southern states voted for Harry Burr, a segregationist senator from Virginia, rather than vote for this pro-civil rights candidate. But a few thousand votes different in Illinois and in Texas. And the whole thing might have turned. And you'll notice a couple southern states are starting to go. The issue was civil rights. And the Nixon campaign ran very hard in like Texas, saying Kennedy's gonna get rid of Jim Crow. Yeah. Um, when did you switch happen for the when the South like the Nixon? It's about ready to okay. You'll see um, for the rest of the 60s, you'll start seeing it, but then the Democrats will break up again in 68 mm -hmm. in the civil rights, and then 72. Did like the party change? It was all about civil rights. All civil rights. And in 72. Mm -hmm. And then 76, the Democrats running Southerner Jimmy Carter from Georgia. And so that was the last little bit of the Southern Democrats, one more kind of last hurrah. But then the next election, all the Southern states were. And so with that, Eisenhower, Eisenhower was, was an interesting man. Remember, he's the general wanted peace. In his farewell address, he warned of something called the industri military industrial complex. Now, usually farewell addresses are pretty unspectacular. You know, Washington, remember, this one remember to a cabal or group of arms manufacturers. The military and politicians will unify to build up the military. But one of the big things they'll do is they'll exaggerate threats like the Soviets or terrorism. Or oh, what's the company today? Oh, Happy Bird in China. They might exaggerate them to build up the weapons. And remember now, if image is everything, our manufacturers have a lot of money to give the politicians. A lot of money. In the Pentagon, in the last budget, asked for less money than Congress voted for. Why? Money. And then he was worried about constant war. Eisenhower was worried about this will lead to war. Will Eisenhower be listened to? No. The biggest peacetime military buildup in American history up to that time will be under John Kennedy. So Kennedy, a liberal Democrat from Massachusetts, was also a Cold Warrior extraordinaire. Built up defenses and also would send many more troops and advisors and make South Vietnam crucial. He would set the stage. And so that's Eisenhower. And your whole life has been at war, most of my life. I was born in a war. We were, both, we were all born in a war, different wars. Spanish-American war for me, for you guys, Iraq and Afghanistan. So Kennedy's program was called the New Frontier. And he desperately wanted to finish the New Deal and Fair Deal. 
not quite as ambitious. It wasn't health care for everybody, but elderly health insurance called Medicare. Also, civil rights. There's more urban renewal, raise the minimum wage, uh, tax cut for working people. But these are the big ones. But the most important one behind the scenes was increasing defense spending. They called it guns and violence. We could have both guns for the Cold War and also vital meaning social programs to try to improve the life of, of Americans. And instead of the new look, which focused on nuclear weapons, he called a flexible response, more conventional. So more focus on tanks. We start building a new tank called the N60, but also coin, which is counterinsurgency to begin to work on specially trained soldiers that could not only fight, but also train countries to fight guerrillas. And let me throw a country out here, South Vietnam. There's a group that was created in the 1950s that Kennedy would expand called the Special Forces. Everybody copies the French when it comes to the military. So they all wore Green Berets and that's how come they're called the Green Berets. And they have language training and also um, very adept at combined arms and guerrilla fighting, because that was a plan. Well, Kennedy proposed this, virtually all his programs died. The only area where Kennedy had any success, was the last speech he was going to give before his assassination was bragging about the increase in defense spending, the new Minuteman missiles in Montana, and our success in South Vietnam. So, in 1961, we'll call it the Bay of Pigs. So remember, Castro decided he's a communist. And so the Eisenhower administration planned to use guerrillas, train them just like happened in Guatemala. They would land at this bay called the Bay of Pigs and trigger a popular uprising. And they trained in Guatemala. There's a shock, isn't it? Weird that uh, Colonel Armas would let American troops train there. And another friendly dictator was in Nicaragua, the Somoza regime, and they would land right here. The problem was for Eisenhower, the plan wasn't ready when Eisenhower, by the time Eisenhower left office. Kennedy was presented this. He didn't like the plan. Not that he didn't like special operations and not that he didn't want to get rid of Castro. It wasn't his plan. And I think you might see the problem with that. If it succeeds, Kennedy won't get all the credit. If it fails, he'll get all the blame. So Kennedy really didn't like this plan, but felt he had no choice. So he okayed it. And they landed here at the Bay of Pigs, a terrible place to land, this swampy region of Southern Cuba. And the plan was for this exile army of about 18,000 men would land. They had an air force. Most of them were former Batista soldiers who had fled Castro. The air force was piloted by CIA, but all secret. We know about it now, but it was secret then. Now there was a contingency plan to let the Navy, if the US Navy can also support it, but Kennedy really didn't want to do that. There's a summit coming up with Khrushchev and that whole World War III. Well, they landed right here. It was a disaster, an absolute disaster. Castro immediately rushed here. It's Castro with a yeah, very thick glass. He didn't like wearing them, but. The people of Cuba did not rally to the exile army. They rallied to Castro. A significant number, even if they didn't trust Castro per se, they were worried about the American history of intervention, and they saw this as another thing like after the Platt Amendment. And so most of them surrendered. Kennedy did not send in the Navy. It was a disaster, an absolute disaster. I should add, without a doubt after this, Castro is going to become very authoritarian, very. So here's Kennedy uh, with the exploding cigar. Get it? The Cuban cigar. Get it? Get it? And Kennedy we blamed. He blamed the CIA. He said, I'll never trust them again. He liked secret operations, but he didn't trust the old cold warriors at the CIA. He'd fire Alan Dulles. And it also, Cuba and the Soviet Union got closer and closer. That's supposed to be a plus. So think about now, Cuba, Kennedy is humiliated. 
and he looks weak. And now he's got a summit in Vienna. Khrushchev is going to meet him two months after that. And Kennedy comes in looking weak. Kennedy then is going to try to act tough. Khrushchev is still mad about the U2 thing. And he thinks he could browbeat the young Kennedy. And so the Vienna summit would be a disaster. There's all lots of smiles here. It was very confrontational. And both men left with the feeling that the Cold War is only going to get worse. Yeah, you can imagine Kennedy was really trying to act tough. And that's, I mean, the bluster and fear leads to bad outcomes. Yeah. It was enough, they, they would thought they, the Paris summit failed. And so there'd be another effort to come together and talk between Khrushchev and Kennedy and maybe set up another arms control. But it was a disaster. The biggest issue was Berlin. Remember, Berlin is the divided city in the East, in what is now, or what was at that time, East Germany. And it was known as the brain drain. Young people all over the East, but especially young Germans, East Germans, were going to Berlin, and the border was open then between East and West Berlin. They were supposed to be free to go back and forth. They were crossing over to the West and not coming back. Remember, Khrushchev wanted to save the Soviet system. How can you save the Soviet system if, you have to, if everyone's leaving? And so when, when he went to Vienna, he went to Kennedy and said, you have to do something about this. Oh, this is what they would give to American soldiers when they were part of the brigade occupying their occupations. This is becoming a real disaster. Not only that, like people who get their retire in West, West Berlin, they would actually go live in East Berlin because the rent was cheap. And so you might have like grandparents on one side and the family on the other side. This is a very curious place. You just you could cross back and forth. When Kennedy and D Kennedy didn't do anything, Khrushchev, exasperated but also very desperate, he and the East Germans built the wall. August 1961, literally overnight, they strung up Constantine wired. Here's two East Berlin police officers in front of the Brandenburg Gate. And they constructed this really pretty cheaply made cinder block wall, but eventually a reinforced cement wall would go up. Therefore, restricting movement back and forth. And yes, families were split. And that's it. That's the way it was. Here, this guard, he had, he had these sunglasses. And he got, he, so he, he was very like noticeable. So all of these newspapers, Photojournalists took his picture. So he was in newspapers all over the United States. This one German officer, and I just find that kind of amusing. Well, in this, to many in the West, and then you can see why West Berliners might think this, they took this to be Soviet aggression. Like they're encircling West Berlin to take it, and who knows what's coming next. And do you, you see how hastily built this was? I mean, you can really see how this just put it as fast as they could put it on. The grandparents are on the other side. That's, what they're doing. That's an East German guard making a break for it in the 70s. I just thought that was a good picture. But in reality, this is Soviet desperation. I mean, if you got to build a wall, you're in real trouble. The Soviets feel really, really isolated. And yes, this was a monstrous state, but this is kind of like poking the bear. There would be a couple of armed standoffs. At this is called Checkpoint Charlie, the American checkpoint into the East Zone. U.S. tanks, Soviet tanks. Eventually, they would put walls and barbed wire all the way around that. So if you grew up in Berlin, you felt like you're grow growing up in this little island that was surrounded. My brother-in-law grew up here. And uh, when he was a kid, he remembers going to the wall. And they would like boost each other over the shoulders. And they would throw water balloons at the East German guard and try to get them to point their guns at them. He's crazy. <laughs> but John Kennedy would go there and give one of his most famous speeches where he, he this is written out phonetically, Ich bin ein Berliner. So he could say it like a German, which means it's very, uh, it's casual. It's, it's not formal German, but it's just a casual way of saying, I'm a citizen of Berlin. Everyone knew what he said. Here's a little bit of the speech. All free men, wherever they may live. 
are citizens of Berlin. And therefore, as a free man, I take pride in the words, Ich bin ein Berliner. But let me, as you're walking out, let me tell you what. But Berliners also eat jelly donuts. So almost immediately you say, to people, oh, you really said it's a jelly donut. And I actually got this little <laughs> jelly donut in Berlin for a 150 euro that says Ich bin ein Berlin. He, everyone knew he was a citizen of Berlin, but if you hear that, that's where that comes from. I couldn't resist the jelly donut. Have a good day, everybody. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye. Goodbye. 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 And I'll put you on. The, that's just so weird. So, so this was from when I was oh. very good. I mean, is it five hundred five or five hundred three? I think it's five hundred five, five hundred three, five hundred three. I'm going to choice. Pick one of the four choices. Okay, so is that the one you're saying the difference between ice or Eisenhower? Yeah. Okay. Okay. You do have that though. I I did, and I threw it away because I thought I had the wrong page. But I can do it at lunch for dinner. Give it to me by the bar for Okay. Now remember those short answer questions. You've got to take down. Here's one of the fours, and there's an A, B, and C. There's an A is a three cent short A, B, and B is a three cent short C. I'm sorry, it's rude away. <laughs> Who do we blame? I'm blaming A. Yeah, yeah. Or Allie. <laughs> okay. <laughs> also, I'll watch the video. Yeah, like, um, when I went to Berlin, there was people like, protesting Chef John Kennedy. You know like, why they would do that? Like there were people like trying to destroy the Kennedy. Like, I, mean, I, I mean I know there's good talk because you know it was fun. Yeah. So I think that's a good Yeah, I got uh, I got two things to give you. Three things. Well, we are so this is a very Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Okay, so I'm going to hand out the um, practice. Okay. So I'll be on the line on tomorrow. Oh, okay. So it's like one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but I'm going to do this. Okay. Five. Okay. Then, okay. Just the one. I'll just one. Okay. You know, so this one is just And then also, for this one, yeah. once again, so since it's doing another session. Yeah, I'm sorry. Why? And so I already did it. Give it to me. So I'm talking about four. I'll just give it to you. I'll just give it to you. I didn't do it on the last one, but I didn't do that on the other one. Oh, you nailed all those. This too. We have to go back and they kind of make sense. But that's why I'm like, you look at the question. All right. But, um. So I just need to have these. Okay, the, the one. Uh, this one is just practice it on down. This one I just gave you. Okay. These ones I'm going to put all together. Three calls. Three calls. Well, one, 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 one. I only Oh, oh, I'm sorry. The answer, the answer. That's, therefore, I'll give you credit. Okay. And don't write on so I can recycle these. Okay. Ones. Does that make sense? Yes. All right. So, how do we do on 218 to 220? I thought that was, I thought there were some pretty tricky ones on that one. Yeah. We're gonna do one more little group, okay? One more little section. A, it's really good to see the question. And I want you to do one more. 393 to 395, one through it. I don't I think I'm just gonna do a small thing. Okay. As we start getting close to the test, I'm gonna get. 393, 395, one through it. And so add this, and then and then I'll collect it on Wednesday. I'll collect it, and then I'll just give you a few points for review. You know why? You know, and and it's it's really good practice. It really is. I'll have some more practice stuff I'll give you. And oh, one more thing. I think I'm going to give. I hinted at it. At the end of the review book, there's a there's a practice test. A full test, I will give you extra credit if you get too many. When does it have to be too many? Like I was going to say Friday. This Friday? Yeah. When you, when you get back. Okay. If, if you want the extra credit. Okay. Unless you want to do the practice. Oh, okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. Okay. And I'll give you extra credit. No, just extra credit, but I would highly recommend it. These are, it's good just to see the questions. And, oh, we watched The Rage Within on Friday. And I did collect that. Did I collect that? I did collect it, yeah. I, so I just got to record you guys. I'll get it back to you tomorrow. That is an assignment. Please watch it. It's really good. Does anyone have a worksheet? Anyone need the worksheet for Rage Within? Is that true? It's, I really like it. Up to the Bill Russell part, you have to watch. It's really good. And just to review on that, what law, what law was from 1896 that said, or what court case, that said separate but equal facilities were constitutional, but then it'd be thrown out, partially thrown out by another case? Yeah, Plessy versus Ferguson. What was the court case? That threw it out for public education. Brown versus, yeah, to be the Board of Education. Now, if let's say we get an essay, there's a good chance you're on the AP exam, you can just put down the Brown decision. The Brown decision is perfectly fine. And, oh, where was the bus boycott? 
begins with M. Montgomery, Montgomery, Alabama, who would not give up her seat when to the when the bus driver asked her to give up her seat. And this was very much planned. You know, they were planning just that, on that moment. That day wasn't planned, but they were ready for it. And who was lynched in Mississippi? They're about to end their thing. I really like how it does that, sets things up. I will give you more practice tests. Oh, review sessions. So I was going through, you know, when I can do it. And I do at night review sessions. And almost everyone's able to come to at least one of them last year. I'll try to record it, but what I can do it. Sunday, 6 p.m. and Wednesday, 6.30 p.m. Come in, you know, that's just when I can do it. And I can't do it earlier, and I can't really do it later. We just kind of stuck. And I know it's 6 o'clock, but that's when I can do it. And with those, not only will I give you, we'll go over things, go over essays, I'll give you great hints, but also, like, for the on that Sunday, that first half of the review packet, I'll answer any question you have on any term. And I would say most of the things I answer will be correct. And then we'll, of course, answer anything you have correctly. It's also a good review in case you have, a, oh, I didn't think about that. Write it down. Go through it again. It really, really helps. And then on Wednesday, I'll go through the second half of the review pack and then go through everything. And then I'll do some at lunch, maybe Thursday or Friday, but also Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. So did we get... What did we did we get here? Did we get him being shot down? We got there, didn't we? I told you about he separated his shoulder. Did I tell you about that? All right. Give me a sec. Still filming, but the got shut off the camera. 